All right, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Crypto 101 Podcast. I'm your host, Bryce. Uh, not joined today by my notorious compadre, Mr. Brendan Veeman. He is off to the races. Uh, he's got a whole lot going on today and was unable to make it. But hey, more for me. More for me. I'm excited to be able to have uh, Greg Taylor all to myself. We get to pick his brain here on the Crypto 101 podcast. He is the chief investment officer of Purpose Investment. Uh, Greg, thanks for joining us on the podcast today. How are you doing? Ah, not too bad. Thanks for having me. It's exciting times in crypto and, and everywhere, it seems like. Yeah, we are on the uh, kind of riding the tailwinds of the launch of the first US based uh, spot Bitcoin ETFs. That was a just a crazy last six months ever since BlackRock kind of announced uh, they were launching it. And then every it was like, you know, all these public filings that were coming out day after day after day. Everybody was like all of a sudden an expert on ETF filings and was an expert on, on you know, fund flows and all this kind of stuff. But, but you're actually a real expert. I mean, I mean, you're not just a Twitter armchair expert. You, you've been doing ETFs for years and years. You've been at the helm of a, a Canadian based um you know a fund called purpose investment that we're going to dive into um but before we dive into that um let, let's catch up on, on who you are greg you know even before crypto what, what were you doing and, and what brought you into this market yeah thanks very much so i'm greg taylor the cio of purpose investments i've been a uh, toronto based uh, company and and i've been working in, in bay street which is canada's version of wall street for a little over 20 years uh started off managing uh, growth equities up here in canada and uh Growth equities in Canada kind of are a bit of an oxymoron because you start with the resource <laughs> sector, then we had that glimmer where research and motion and Nortel were big tech players, and then you go, to, yeah. you go back to commodities, and then running growth funds. We even had the fun a few years ago of managing cannabis, as that was a big growth industry in Canada for a while. Now it's had a bit of a tough time in the last uh, few weeks, but or a few years, and we'll see if that that uh, affects anything at all. But also, uh, Canada is notorious for launching new in industries and different things and being a little further out the risk spectrum. And I think uh, Canada is kind of doing that because we come from a resource-based background that there's a lot of the Canadian capital markets are set up to finance junior mining and junior gold companies. So there's a bit more of a, a risk tolerance to startups. And, and with that, uh, we've also gotten the reputation, or at least we're able to have the stamp of approval of a few years ago launching the world's first crypto ETF. And that's really what purpose is bringing to the table. And, and I, my background coming from managing growth equities uh, makes it so it's suitable to, to this and then try and figure out what's next. And, and we'll see what the, the next evolution of growth in Canada comes after this. That's awesome. Um, and, and so if we were to kind of boil down the purpose or the mission of uh, purpose investment, what would you say it is? Well, the big thing that we've tried to do, and, and there's a lot of ETF providers out there already, and, and Purpose um, it has been around for 10 years. We're around 19 billion of AUM currently. Wow. And what, when our uh, our chairman and founder, Sam Seif, uh, who was at uh, Claymore before that, which is now part of BlackRock, uh, one of the things that they came out with was trying to really be a pioneer in the space and to evolve and to, to help advisors with new solutions. So when Purpose was started 10 years ago, it was not to be the, the basic ETFs of index funds. It was all about trying to work with advisors on solving problems that they had. And, and that can range from a lot of things. It's one ways of getting access to money market funds in a simple ETF wrapper. So we've launched some of those. It's getting access to the high-grade investment bond funds, which we've worked on. It's trying to bring hedge fund strategies, which people like from options writing and, and private investments back to the masses. Mm -hmm. And and that's kind of what we, we concentrate on is working on solving problems advisors have and making it so that more sophisticated solutions come back to the market and we can put it into an ETF form so everyone can get access to it. And, and that's really what brought us to the crypto space because uh, we saw that there's a lot of people from the advisor community, but also from the retail market that if we wanted exposure to crypto and were struggling through the nuances of how to do it. And, and we think that an ETF is always the best solution or should be one of the best solutions for people. So that's where we set up and we launched our, our first uh, filing with the OSC, so the Ontario Securities Commission, uh, back in 2017, trying to bring an ETF of crypto. Uh, at that point in time, the, the system wasn't ready for it, but uh, we were able to launch the world's first spot Bitcoin ETF uh, back in February of 2021. And uh, so far, it's, it's nice to see the Americans uh, joining the party and uh, catching up three <laughs> years later. 
No, it's so true. I mean, th there's so many questions I have uh, for Gary, uh, but you're not Gary. Uh, Gensler, who's the head of SEC, who's just been dragging his feet and I think political motivations and all sorts of speculation that we could dive into, but not worth it, okay? Because guess what? That's history. It's in the books now. Crypto guys win, um, and the rest is still being written. We've had you know lots of different flows and stuff. But um, yeah, it's just, you know, it is crazy to see how ahead of the, the curve Canada was. Um, and like you said, it has, it kind of might go back to just the, the very history of the founding of, of capital markets uh, in, the, in the country compared to the United States. Uh, you guys are much more tolerant with, with risk um, and, and, you know, for the sake of growth. Yeah. And, and that being said, well, I, I do agree that, and as I was mentioning, that Canada, I think, is is more open to financing risk and financing areas that traditional finance doesn't want to go to, which is really the, the heart of financing junior resource companies, which is where we come from. But, but that being said, I think the best thing we can say is that our regulator didn't just say no. Uh, when we approached them and said back in 2017, we wanted to launch a, a crypto ETF. It, it, what they didn't approve it at that point in time. I didn't say go away and never talk to us again. It's come back when things are better and the ecosystem's improved, and mm -hmm. that's what happened. So when we relaunched and refiled back in the in the summer of 2020, uh, things were getting better. Like that was still during the COVID period, so everyone's locked in their house working from home. But yeah. there's still a lot of innovation going on, and our regulator, to their credit was willing to listen and say, yeah, the system's gotten a lot better. The ecosystem around crypto has improved dramatically. Uh, the exchanges are a lot better. There is some forms of regulation um, and, and the system is ready. So we spent a ton of time working with the regulator on showing that things are getting better. This is something that's going to help improve people's lives and help them to invest. And, and to their credit, that's what they did. And they worked with us and approved it. And and our fund, I'd say, has had a decent track record in the three years running. And I think that success has gone a long way to allowing the SEC to say, okay, fine, uh, we should do this too. And this isn't something that uh, we want to put in the, keep in off the mainstream for any longer. Yeah. You guys were quite literally um, three years ahead, um, almost to the day, um, you know, about two years and 11 months or something like that. But it's, it's crazy. I mean, you know, you guys have been, you know, tracking the price of Bitcoin. Um, it's been, you know, secure. Investors have loved it. It's been a liquid trading instrument. Um, and, and that's just one of the, you know, you know, trading instruments you have. Again, 19 billion under management. Um, how much of that actually is in the, the Bitcoin purpose ETF? So our crypto lineup would be around three billion of the AUM. Uh, the rest would be uh, spread between equities, the fixed income, and and the other alternative forms of assets. So, crypto is a uh, is just three of the nineteen, but it's something we want to keep growing and and thinking it's an area that we uh, have have built a track record and being able to deliver and work with uh, to, in the favor of our investors. Yeah, and and I want to dive into it, kind of what some of those other crypto ETFs that y'all have are, and kind of with the backdrop of. You know, we want to look to Canada to see where the puck might be going. And this isn't just like a hockey pun. This yeah. is you guys, you know, we're three years ahead of the crypto, the, the Bitcoin ETF. Do you guys have other ETFs that might then indicate, hey, an Ethereum ETF might not be that far out or some other more colorful, uh, you know, indexes or ETFs that, that have many different cryptos? They might eventually be introduced into America, but but let's hear about what you guys have. Yeah, absolutely. So I can tell you exactly what we did. So after we launched our our Bitcoin ETF, which was in early February of 2021, uh, we immediately filed and then had been filing previously with an Ethereum ETF, uh, same format, same structure, which we can get into later. Um, and to that point of view, we we did get approval to launch that in April of 2021. So roughly three-ish months after we launched the Bitcoin ETF uh, and the Ethereum ETF was was created. And that's had um, lesser demand and it's probably pretty similar to the ratio between the size of the total market cap of Bitcoin versus Ethereum uh, in that form. And, and I think there's still going to be a lot of optimism for Ethereum. And, and we've been seeing that as you look at the price, that once the it kind of became obvious that the SEC was going to approve the Bitcoin ETF, uh, the price of Bitcoin still went up but even more so was the price of ethereum which uh really took off i think on this exp expectation that that's coming yeah um the other thing that we did after that is in addition to when we launched our, our bitcoin etf um the much the the stock exchange here that provides options markets uh launched options on our etf 
So this is just your normal, like you have an options on the, the spiders or the triple Qs or any uh, or Apple stock uh, that trades. So you can buy and sell calls on those funds. And one of the strategies that we started to notice that some smart hedge funds were doing is really harvesting this volatility. So we all know there's a lot of volatility in, in the crypto market. Uh, and so when the options market started to form around their ETF, we saw a number of people that would buy the ETF and then write calls uh, on it out about a month. So that's mm -hmm. called a covered call strategy. So what you're doing is you're you're selling the option premium of a higher price. And if it never gets there, you, you basically got another income. So we took the stance uh, about six months after we launched our both our Ethereum and Bitcoin ETFs to launch uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum yield funds. So these trade wow. like ETFs up in Canada, uh, still track the underlying, uh, but they also get a monthly income. So we harvest that volatility by writing calls and up to 50% of them. And right now, and the yield will vary depending on the volatility, but the Ethereum fund yields around 15%, the Bitcoin fund yields 12%. So you're able to track uh, the underlying to, to a certain degree, but you also get a nice monthly income. So that's the evolution that we had in Canada. And, and certainly we're looking at whether we launch uh, other other crypto assets in the, a pure coin. Uh, there's a lot of talk about Solana or some of the other coins out there. Uh, so we'll see if the ecosystem and the demand is there for that. Uh, but I think the natural step you're going to see is the Ethereum and then maybe some of these alternative strategies, whether it's a yield product or something else on the risk arc type fund. That, that's incredible. Um, I, I know that there's always a lot of questions around yield, kind of where it comes from, how it's being, um, you know, kind of passed on to the the end end user. Um, and we don't need to get too much in, into the weeds. Um, you're a CIO and, and we're, um, you know, Crypto 101. Um, so we want to kind of know, you know, what does that look like? If I were to buy one of these, uh, I was going to say one of these tokens, but one of these ETFs, and it has a yield component built in. So I own the Bitcoin, but I also earn like a dividend. Um, kind of where does that come from? How, how, how can I expect to maybe like account for that? Uh, so it'll be it'll be taxed in Canada as capital gain, but it'll look on your account like a dividend comes out. So it's paid on a monthly okay. basis where we pay out the income, but it's uh, at least by the Canadian tax code taxed as capital gain because it's you're harvesting the capital gain and not taking it as a dividend. But it, it is something that you'd be buying it as a regular ETF, and then you track the underlying to the best you can, and then then you're giving you're generating the income and paying it out on a monthly basis to the the account uh, holders uh, account. That's very cool. Um, yeah, I, I know that there's a bunch of um, kind of crypto tokens and stuff that that are starting to do that. Um, th there's one um, called R Ribbon Finance, and they have all sorts of different um, vaults where you could contribute to a vault, and it's it's almost it kind of sounds exactly like what you guys are doing, covered call strategies and stuff. Um, so it's just incredible to see all the all the different you know levels of innovation. But I, I want to kind of tie this back to what's really hot in the news, which is this ETF in America. There's nine of them um, that all launched all at once, and then I think there was um, the grayscale one that kind of converted. Um, so maybe there's ten or ten or eleven of these things now. What's what's the big deal? Like, why did so many? Why did this get so much media attention? Why is it, if these already existed for three years, they're in a bunch of different countries. Why this? Why now? Why does it matter? Well, I, I think it's really going to matter because, as we all know, the American retail market is probably the biggest form of the pool of investors in the world. And, and I think that's really all it is. It comes back to supply and demand. And this, all things being created equal, should make it easier for the average American retail investor to get exposure to crypto. Uh, there's been other ways to get it in the past, whether it's the Grayscale Fund, which which you referenced. Uh, there was a futures-based ETF, which we can talk about also, that was launched a few years ago, which there's a lot of things that people have problems with futures-based ETFs. Um, we can leave that for another topic. But this really, a pure spot back Bitcoin ETF, is, for all intents and purposes, the purest way to get access to the underlying commodity. And this makes it so much easier than, and I don't have to tell you or your audience about how a traditional person would go and buy Bitcoin or any coin for that matter, opening up a crypto exchange, dealing with a crypto trading party, figuring out if it's a cold or a hot wallet you're going to store it in, making sure you don't lose your keys. Like all, all it's these daunting, all these, it's complex. <laughs> and, and for a lot of people, they just don't want to do that. And then we don't even want to open the Pandora's box of if you want to be above board and file taxes and, and make sure you're, you're doing that all correctly. Um, right. So having it in an ETF 
this makes it so much easier for everyone to get exposure for that. They can hold it in their normal Charles Schwab or whoever account you have. You can sometimes get margin off it if your broker is set up to, to have a margin account so you can borrow against it. And it's just so much easier from a reporting point of view. Your advisors, if you're using one, can see your total portfolio with all your stocks, your bonds, and your, your crypto exposure. And so it's it just so much simpler that I think that's where the excitement is, that for all those people that are thinking about looking at crypto and didn't know how to do it in the past, this opens up that, that door. So this is a pure demand function. And we all know the supply of, of Bitcoin is basically regimented out for the next 100 plus years. And, and this is something that's not going to change. So this should be bringing in more buyers. And the hope is going to be that when, when demand goes up and supply stays fixed, then you're going to see prices go higher. And I think that's where the excitement really comes in. Yeah. So many things to touch on there. Um, with, with Bitcoin being an, an asset, you know, I, I saw Larry Fink on TV uh, the day after the Bitcoin ETF launched, and he's you know thirty minute kind of uh, you know one on one. I think a squawk on the street or something like that, and just talking about like his conversion uh, from a crypto hater, and we've all seen those uh, things where he's like, oh, Bitcoin's an index for money laundering, and you know only bad people use it. And then he said three years ago, it hit him when he started to learn about tokenization and you could have um, you know, all the world's assets on kind of a, a unified ledger, um, certain, you know, this accounts-based system. And, and you know, he kind of goes on and, and talks about this real-world asset tokenization. Um, and he says he's, he's so bullish on, on where this is going. Um, and, and so when you kind of think about it from that standpoint, um, are, are, are you, you have that. He's one of the most powerful men in finance. Then you have the guy, which I, I, I should know his name, um, the CEO of Vanguard, takes the complete opposite stance and says, there's nothing valuable about crypto. In fact, I'm not going to allow anybody to buy these Bitcoin or crypto-related products through Vanguard, You know, which is also crazy. But like, do you see also kind of where he's coming from? Do you think he's just, you know, fell off the turnip truck? You know, kind of how do you kind of, rationalize both of these two different viewpoints in your mind well there's, there's a, and that's the big debate and that's a whole other yeah hour segment but but there's i think there's a bunch of things that happened in the last few years and I, and we all know the volatility but i think at the end of the day it's actually probably good for the crypto market at the end because like, we came out of the covid lockdowns and and the way that we we basically got through that is there was so much money printing um, every government started just blowing up their balance sheet to pay people to stay home and put them on stimulus programs we had mm -hmm. central banks lower interest rates to zero and basically double the size of their balance sheet overnight and i think that opened up the door for a lot of people to say wait a minute why are all my assets in something that's backed by a fiat currency that people can just double the supply of overnight and, yeah. and I think that got people to say, well, do I really want to have everything backed by a dollar or would I rather have some part of my assets that are backed by, we'll use the term real assets. And, and we're starting to see through traditional finance, more people talk about uh, portfolio theory of looking at your asset mix, not just equities and fixed income, but including a bucket of real assets. And, mm -hmm. and that includes real estate and, and, and gold or different other commodities. So that sleeve has gotten more attention in the last little bit as people want something that's not correlated to, to money printing. And, and within that sleeve, I think there's some segment are saying, well, do I really want gold or do I want something more that's modern? And that's where I think the whole cryptocurrency comes in and more finance guys that are looking at this traditional are saying, well, may, wait a minute, should I look at this? It's only been around 15 years, but still it's, it's gotten a lot of attention. We know the market cap of Bitcoin and it's not going away anytime soon. And, and so I think that's starting to change the narrative. And people are saying, well, maybe I need something more in that real asset bucket. Do I really want to hold gold, which some people like? And I'll admit, I, I think gold has a place in people's portfolio. But maybe some people want something more modern and Bitcoin could be one of the areas to get access to it. Uh, the other thing, which I think really might have been messy and volatile for a lot of people, but the collapse of the exchanges last year, I, I think is going to turn out to be a positive. And I know that, that doesn't reassure people that lost money and lost their coins but at the end of the day it was becoming a bit of the wild west and there were a lot of bad actors in there and that had to go away and we needed a little more regulation to make this more mainstream uh it was messy and we saw a lot of problems but i think coming out the other side with more regulation involved some of the bad actors out of there 
this is going to prove out to be a pretty positive thing for the whole ecosystem as it had to mature, it had to go through that that messy period. And coming out the door, I, I think you're, you're going to find things healthier and in some degree of regulation is going to be positive for the overall space. Yeah, man, couldn't, couldn't agree more. Um, in so many kind of interesting touch points there, but I want to kind of harken back to what you were talking about just with your, your macro sort of thoughts about inflation and interest rates. Um, and kind of the landscape you, you touched on it. I'm just, you know, kind of curious. Um, and again, nothing that we say on this show is ever construed as financial advice or investment advice. Um, but we just like to get your thoughts, and we like to get educated on on how smart people are thinking about the future. Um, and, and if you kind of look at Q1 coming up, I mean, what can we expect? What What are you kind of anticipating, or what's the outlook for the crypto market? Uh, well, I think I'll speak a little more of the broader market and then I can kind of touch on the yeah. crypto market in general. But I think the broader market is is going to be a volatile year. Uh, we all know what last year did with the NASDAQ up 50% and then such and led by the strength of NVIDIA and Microsoft and a lot of these giant tech companies. I, I think 2024 is going to be a bit more of a, a sorting out period. Uh, everyone's been worried about a recession in the US. It seems to be something that we've talked about for 18 months and it hasn't arrived. Uh, <laughs> this could be a year that, that might start to shape up in the second half of the year, but we all know that heading into US elections, uh, strange things happen and they kind of kick off, kick down recessions down the road because no one wants a recession while they're in office. So might not be the year you get a recession in the US, but it does feel like it's gonna be a lot of volatility. Uh, earnings growth may slow for the overall market. And, and I think you are definitely going to start to see central banks start to cut rates. Uh, we went through the most aggressive hiking cycle in history over the last uh, two years. And I think now that they're starting to see that that's gone a little too far and inflation has pulled back, so you're going to start seeing uh, cutting rates. Um, where that could tie into the crypto market, again, it's back in this real asset category, because one thing that has happened in the last few years with the aggressive um, rate hikes by the, the, the U.S. central banks, that has really put a lot of emphasis on the strength of the U.S. dollar. So the U.S. dollar has gone up basically against all currencies. Um, if you have any Japanese friends or listeners, the Japanese yen has collapsed, the, the euro is under pressure, the pound's under pressure. And, and the U.S. dollar has really been the king currency for the last 10 plus years. Uh, with central banks starting to ease back, other parts of the world might start to recover a little bit. You could start to see some weakness in the U.S. dollar versus some of these other peers. And again, when, almost going back to the way most people look when they trade gold, when the U.S. dollar goes down in value, real assets go up in value. So if you're starting to look at crypto and, and uh, crypto and Bitcoin in particular as, as something that's an alternative to the U.S. dollar, it could start to do a little better in that point of view. So I, I'd expect more of a, a, a slower year from a macroeconomic point of view, verging on a recession later in the year. But it also could be with rate cuts uh, more bearish for the U.S. dollar, which could be better for these real assets. Yeah, and it could it could time up well. Um, you know, all, all those things. Yeah, I mean, it could time up well, kind of with this uh, the Bitcoin having cycle, um, which there's kind of been this four year theory. We've only had you know three data points to go off of, but it seems like every every having cycle it typically tops out, right? The, big, the Bitcoin price tops out about 15 months or 18 months after, which would kind of line us up right in the beginning of uh, 2026. Um, so who knows? Maybe the recession comes then. Um, well, and it, could all, and it could all line up again with just going back to supply demand because the halving will take away some supply or at least the slow of the right. pace again. And and if we do have this bold scenario that bringing on the US ETF brings more demand in, so you're kind of lining up a uh, slowdown of the pace of supply with the potentially the biggest investor base looking at it. And that could, I don't want to give predictions, but that's uh, usually a, a, a formula for hire. And it, yeah, exactly. And it could be big. I mean, I think it's one of those things like, you know, the immediate impact was, there's a lot to go here, but the immediate impact was sell the news, right? Because it kind of just, a lot of people were front running it. People positioned, opened up longs, bought in anticipation. I think the price of Bitcoin went up from about 26,000 up to around you know 49,000 by the time it launched. Um, right. And so there was a lot of, you know, of that baked in. So now, it, you know, it traded back down to around 40. Um, so it, the, the short-term impact was a little bit of the sell the news. But if you think about the long-term impact and you zoom way out, I mean, if you remember back in March when there was this regional banking crisis, 
Everything was selling off, correlations to one. Bitcoin caught this bid that was just crazy, right? And, and everybody was kind of waking up to this idea like, holy shit, like the bank's not might not have the money, but if we go to Bitcoin, it was just the perfect narrative. It was super sweet. And people just, you know, went, you know, the spot bid on Bitcoin went limit up. And I think it was because that narrative, that mindset, the mentality of like, if it could happen in America, that banks could fail and not have your money, it could happen anywhere. In fact, it is happening places. And there is, you know, Balaji's, you know, big whole bet that the whole world, you know, this sovereign debt bubble was collapsing, all this stuff. And that's always been a thing. But I think that the idea here with the Bitcoin ETF, now people can just with the click of a button, take their portfolio and turn it from stocks and bonds directly into Bitcoin. And they don't have to go and set up a Coinbase account. They don't have to have all this thought that could get in their way of making a, an investment decision. They can now have it on the same terminal, in the same account, margin it, all that kind of stuff. So the, the, it's a latent potential that this Bitcoin ETF has just unlocked. And now it's up to the people to kind of open the door. But as you know, Bitcoin thrives off of all this fear or this, all these narratives, right? And so it's going to be so much easier to buy. This is going to be huge. I just, uh, I just can't be excited. I mean, I'm sure you share a lot of the same excitement, but um, and how how big can this get? I mean, you know, what are what what orders of magnitude could we be talking about in terms of, you know, demand? Yeah, and I th there's a lot of things you can do with that, but but I agree. I I wouldn't get caught up in the short term nature of of this at all. It, it's to me, this is one of those classic finance trading things that would sell the news. Like how many mm -hmm. times have you ever seen something rally into a news that's supposed to be positive? It hits the headline and it goes down. And we've seen this every, you've seen this in the commodity markets for hundreds of years. So this yeah. to me is just, again, maybe it's more of a stamp of approval. It's acting like every other commodity that runs into <laughs> it, and get it and falls. So I wouldn't worry about the short term nature. I wouldn't worry if it dropped back below 40,000. It doesn't mean it's over. It doesn't mean it's not demand. It's just, everyone's we're in this uh, society that everything has to be instantaneous and the fact it didn't double overnight it isn't something we should worry about but it does yeah. feel like again this brings it more mainstream it brings on more demand it brings on more buyers and you're going to get more people watching it and they may not say oh, i'm going to buy it today but they could say hey i'm going to watch all these these etfs how they trade for the next year and see and if it happens maybe i'm going to start allocating a little bit more to my portfolio and and one area, one analogy that i've heard a few people have mentioned and again, it keeps going back to gold. And again, this maybe it's a real asset thing, but the gold ETFs really came out in the early 2000s. So the first U.S. gold ETF, uh, I believe the GLD, uh, came in 2004. And um, prior to that, like you could always buy gold. You'd have to go to a jeweler or jeweler or go to the bank and buy a coin and find Put the it bar. Put in your safe deposit. <laughs> yeah, and figure where you're going to bury it in your backyard and make sure you can remember where it is. And <laughs> yeah. and and again, that's not something that really fits into the traditional finance model either. But uh, bringing the the gold ETFs on really started to make it more mainstream. And these gold ETFs now are multiple hundred billion of billions of dollars, and that brought in more demand. Uh, mm -hmm. And that definitely made it so people can get access to to gold in their portfolio the way they couldn't before. So you can use that as your analogy again for for Bitcoin. Um, some of the knock on effects that were really interesting when you go back and look at that time. Um, prior to that, if you looked at the gold companies, uh, if you want exposure to gold, you actually had to buy stock in the gold miners. So the gold right. mining companies, and they traded at huge valuations. Um, they traded at. Um, probably use too much technical terms here, but two to three times net asset value. So higher multiple than what they're worth. As soon as those gold ETFs got launched, over time, they started to trade at to net asset value than below because there wasn't mm -hmm. a need for the premium because you could actually go back and just buy the, the commodity to get exposure to it. So in fact, there was a lot of operational risk with those miners too. So it should actually trade at a discount. Yeah, absolutely. It's, they're not, it's not an easy business and to credit to the miners that can actually do it and they should get a yeah, premium, yeah. but not everyone. So it'll be interesting to see just from a knock on effect in the crypto world of how these other derivative plays work. Like we've got a, some pretty big valuations, of some of the Bitcoin miners out there that may not yep. get that scarcity value. What about some of the other, uh, the other crypto related equities and, they're getting they had gotten a bit of a scarcity value because they were the only game in town but now people might say well maybe i should just look at the coins and the, and getting the direct exposure through the etf versus taking on operational and equity uh, risk uh, with some of these other companies so something to watch and i think there's gonna be a lot of lessons you can take from looking at how 
that gold ETF trader than how it evolved because it's only been 20 years ago, but I think there's some pretty good parallels. Yeah. No, I mean, it makes me just think about how, um, you know, how the miners are going to survive the halving and even how, you know, a company like MicroStrategy now fares um, kind of in competition with all these other um, ETFs. I think about Coinbase, kind of, you know, they're custodying all these assets and they're making fees, but in a sense, well, if people are going to now, you know, trade the ETF, are they going to need to, you know, trade on Coinbase? Like maybe in in some way they it backfires. A lot of questions. Yeah, a lot of questions. But you know, we don't have enough time for all those. But what I do have time to ask you is just kind of in a in a in a general sense, um, if if there's a person who's a listener to Crypto 101 and they're they're just kind of starting to break into the industry, how do they think about allocating? like kind of a personal portfolio to crypto. And, um, you know, do you have any general numbers that, that you kind of have seen as a market standard or how do you think about that? So I would keep going back to, again, the real asset uh, allocation, because I, I think there's definitely a place for portfolio theory. So the core of your assets should be in, in liquid, large cap with equities and fixed income as kind of the core. And then it's trying to figure out around the edges where you can find some some niche sources of um, exposure that will fit your risk uh, tolerance and risk profile. So traditional sense is gold should be between 3 to 5% of your portfolio. Uh, crypto probably shouldn't be that different for, for most people, but everyone's different. Everyone's in a different phase of their life. Some will take on more risk if they're able to. And, and uh, I think this is something that is more of a personal decision than just a generalization of, of how much people should put into the, in the crypto. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Everybody's got to do their own research and yeah. uh, you know find what works for them. Get, get with your financial planners. Um, my last question for you is, uh, what's next for Purpose? Um, I, I'm just curious, any new products, any new uh, big, big announcements that you could uh, release to us? Well, we want to make sure that we still uh, keep our... Our, our leadership stake in crypto. Um, like, well, Purpose has has a lot of exposure through fixed income and equities and other areas. Uh, crypto has been an interesting development for us, and and I think an area that has gone fairly well as uh, as well. And and we're happy with what we've done to to make it uh, for a lot of investors, both retail and institution, to access to it. So we want to keep to keep uh, with these funds. Uh, I think the track record speaks for itself that it has done what it's supposed to do over the last three years of trading. Basically at, at NAV and with a fairly tight uh, bid ask spread and also offering lots of liquidity, as we've had uh, days of up to 500 million of, of trading volume and wow. and and I think that's something we want to keep building off of. So we want to keep uh, keep ex- keep uh, expo- ex- way going back to trying to find ways for retail investors to get access to sophisticated markets. Crypto is absolutely one of those. So we want to figure out what we can do to to keep our leadership work with our regulators and try and bring new products to to the average investor that will help them and hopefully get followed by the Americans three years later. <laughs> Incredible. Greg, yeah. thank you so much for coming on to the show, um, for giving us a glimpse into the future. And uh, we hope to have you back on again soon. Um, you let us know okay. when you're around and uh, we're happy to have another conversation. A lot, of, lot, of, lot more questions, but um, until then, stay warm. Yeah, thanks very much. Have a good day. Yep, you bet. All right, everybody who's listening at home, thanks for tuning in. Uh, Have a great rest of your day and come back same time, same place next week. More amazing guests.